Science Jam for June, and today we're very delighted to have Dr. Fernando Rosas here. Uh, Fernando is working as a postdoctoral researcher at Environmental College London, and his studies is mainly uh, related to, say, uh, developing tools for the, uh, to study the interdependencies uh, between the interacting uh, agents in complex systems. And today he's giving a talk about the quantification of emergence and its application in studying brain. So let's welcome for George. Thank you. Yes, I'm really happy to for the opportunity to present today. Yeah, that's a little update. So I, I'm still sort of working in Europe, but now I'm also an assistant professor in Sussex. Oh. I try to very little. And yeah, I have to still update my my online <laughs> life. <laughs> uh, so I will present today about emergence. So I work in too many things, but one of the main things I work is on emergence. And emergence in particular neuroscience. So in neuroscience, we have this situation that we have some structure. So we are, there are some wiring and stuff like that. Then on top of the structure, you have some function. You have neural activity, neural firing, populations of the thing. And then on top of that, you can analyze that activity and you can get some patterns of all the and somehow all that thing gave rise to us, right? And the question is how the hell that happens. And particularly, uh, that, like your time have done like incredible progress in very low level things, like how the visual system work, how the auditory system, the muscle system, all that fire pit is like impact in a very good way. But when you go for like the, the complicated big things, we still know fairly little. And uh, that is the, um, of course, I'm not going to solve that, but that's sort of the direction of my interest, especially cognition and question. And now, from a complexity perspective, uh, usually when in science, when we have any situation that we are interested in, our approach by reflex is to say, okay, this is what I want to solve, so I can divide it in these models. Then I, I study each of them separately, I solve them ideally, and after I solve them, I connect them, and then I have done everything. So that's what our scientific reflex. What, what makes it, good. but in some cases it doesn't work. And then that means there's something funny, something really interesting and then complexity comes in, right? And in complexity, uh, the idea, you know, when there are like, too many interconnections back and stuff like that, usually you cannot do this clean division. You, you can always do it, but sometimes the parts are so small that you solve them and you still don't know anything. Like we understand neurons and how the signals come in and how they come out. And are we learning about cognition? Of course not. Yeah, like the gap between level 15 is too big. But on the other hand, we want to still keep things as simple as we can. So we, we never want to kill flies with cannons. And if we can solve things in an easier way, we should always try to do that. But the point is that we want to do things simple as simple as possible, but not simpler than possible. So all that said, emergence. <laughs> right, so I I hope most of you have some feeling of what emergence might be. So you know this local bird that uh, is sort of a ma ma macro bird emerging from the more bird. So we sort of recognize it when we see it. Here's another very cute video where we have all these little critters fighting this dog, and and, and they do a pretty good job in keeping it. You know, mm -hmm. They coordinate and become this very strong organized system. So so. This thing is around us, we recognize it, and the question is, what, how can we formalize it? How can we measure it? So for this, uh, the menu for the talk of today, first I'm going to argue in favor of formal mathematical approaches to study emergence. So emergence has been studied philosophy for ages, and, and the idea here is not to replace that, but to complement the discussion we'll see. And then uh, I will present so then a more specific way of doing this. So there are multiple ways of doing it, but I will present one that I have been working on. And then I will briefly mention how we're using that approach to study the brain. And then from okay. somewhere. So that, that is the very plan for today. So to start, let's start with a little bit of philosophy. I, I, the, the idea in general is to keep philosophy at minimum, but not below the minimum. So we need a little bit. And the first question is what is emergence? How do we uh, approach this question? What we mean? So there are basically different approaches that we can take. The first is to say there's no emergence; it's just physics. You know, so the dog is just a machine, and the brain is just another machine, but it, it, it's too small. That's the only mystery. So if we could be smaller enough to walk inside the brain, there would be no mystery. 
but if it's too small and too many parts, so it looks complicated, but there's nothing to be seen if you draw it. This is a reductionist perspective. Then another perspective is to say, well, even if we have the perfect string theory or whatever, we would still not be able to predict communism <laughs> from string theory. You know? And some physicists will deny that. But <laughs> I would say most people will be in favor of that. And then if we accept that we cannot do that prediction, the question is why? So one stands to say that prediction is impossible in principle. So it's not a matter of computational resources or anything. It just cannot be done. And then you go to the realm of strong emergence that says that there are some macroscopic features like communism make people do things that you couldn't predict from particular physics. But there are some micro things that can cause the power over the world. Then the other option is to say the, the possibility only holds in practice. So it's just that we are not so smart and you know yes, computationally right. limited, etc. So in principle, it could be done, but it's just so far. And then, and then that's the world of weak emergence. So even in these three positions that I think they are all logically possible, you cannot reject them by by logic. It's like oh, you're, you're nonsense. Now all of this can be taken legally, let's say. And now, if we have these three people, what do you think about you know the possibility of emergence? So how this macro thing having reduced the cost of power? They're going to have very different reaction. Reductionists would say there is none such a thing at all. Strong emergency would say, of course, there are some. Specific ones, not everything is emergent, but there are some things that are emergent. And then the weak emergency will say they look like it, but it's not. There's some position in between. Now, the way I see this discussion is like this. So there are two undefined things, like we don't know how to measure cost of power, we don't know what is irreducible, we don't know nothing. So we can do a lot of discussions and they will be interesting, but we're not going to be able to decide this based on in this discussion, unless we start specifying more what we mean with everything, basically. And, and can we measure something? So the, the main aim of this is to try to bring this idea that are so cool to science in order to do something with data. So if we take this magical emergence in one hand and this um, explain away emergence on the other hand, I, personally for me, both of them are super non, 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 I'm not happy with neither. I feel frustrated with both. So I would like to be somewhere in between. And the question here is, what are the options in between? And usually the, 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 the game is how much I need to put in and how much I can get out for what I put in. Like, it's like investments. So where I can assume a few things and I get a lot of things out and, and, and see, the, see the options. So that, that's the story. And so more formally, the goal would be to build a philosophically lightweight framework. So we would like to do a little bit of this velocity, but keep it at minimum. And to build a framework that can help us to reason about emergence with the goal of establishing formal hypotheses. So we would like to be able to formalize an hypothesis about emergence and then verify that hypothesis from data. So for example, if I think cognition or consciousness is an emergent property of the brain, I would not like to convince you based on my, the movements of my hands. I would like to be able to state that formally. So what I mean is exactly this, and then I get some data and I get data to decide. So that's it. So about that. So the philosophy of emergence has a very, very long tradition and there's a lot to be learned there. And the mathematics of emergence have a relatively short uh, lifespan. They started basically 10, 15 years ago. What I think a mathematics can bring to the discussion, <clears throat> first, uh, mathematics in general can help us to guide our intuition when things become a bit confusing. You know, when you go to infinite dimensional vectors or something, you, your intuitions start failing miserably, but math can really help you. So you will grab your math and trust it, you know, so that's useful. Then you can also bring precise definition that can help you to formalize conjectures and can lead you to algorithms that can help you to test those conjectures statistically. So, and in my view, this is a personal opinion, I think math and philosophy have very different goals when they face emergence. Philosophy asks about what is the fundamental nature of emergence, which is a fascinating question. But math is more like, what can we do with emergence? Can we, can we do something useful out of it? And there have been a number of um, formalisms uh, of efforts to formalize emergence, to build it into mathematics. Um, I'm highlighting three here. There, there are more, but these are, in my view, the main ones. 
And I, I have been working in the second. And interestingly, all these theories are correct. You cannot say they're wrong mathematically, there's something inconsistent. <laughs> they're all correct. And the question more is like, what do they mean exactly? And what can we do with it? And because so. this is the one I know the best because I have been working on it, that and the rest of the talk I will focus on it. I recommend you if you're interested in the topic to also go over the rest. But I will focus on this. This is an example of this is one way of doing things, and this is what we have been able to get out of this. All right. And if you have any technical question, please stop me and ask at any point. If you have a long philosophical question, send me to them and then we can go deeper. Okay. Cool. So uh, let's go to how we do this. <coughs> so we are going to focus on something called meriological emergence. Meriological meriology is a very fancy word for parts and faults. So we want to study emergence from the whole point of view of how parts relate and create something as a whole. And in, in, informally, we would say that emergence is when the whole exhibits properties that cannot be traced down to it. So that is an informal starting point that we're going to take to start going forward. And we have this sort of feeling that we see some pictures and like, yeah, it seems that there is something like that there. So we, we have an intuition to that. But I could take as a guidance and inspiration this early work from 1994 in neuroscience of these three gentlemen that suggested they were studying brains and they were studying like what the brain, human brain is a special thing, like structurally or functionally, what is, what, is, what is distinctive of how the brain works. And they proposed that the brain has two forces that sort of balance each other. One is the differentiation, meaning different parts of the brain do different things. So we have the occipital cortex that takes care of the visual, we have the temporal pain that the auditory, we have the motor cortex, etc. So different parts of different things, but they are integrated. So they don't do their thing in the independence of the rest. Somehow they work together. And if you think it from a criticality perspective, sort of, you would say, oh yeah, it's sort of a good bug, right? Trade-offs. But that my take of this trailer, that is not very explicit in the paper, but that's my interpretation of it, is that these things are actually not antithetical. They are not fighting against each other, although it seems like it seems like they are like the you know the, the bright and the dark and the, like, the, the, right, the right balance. They actually don't. And then you can take both at the same time, which is sort of well surprising. But when you have both at the same time, then you have this thing called synergy. How can I give a little bit of more, you know, intuitive explanation of how the hell can that happen? Maybe you have seen this for membranes before, maybe you don't. This is a geometric construction that you cannot take these rings apart if you try, they are entangled. But if with your mind you take the blue ring out of the picture, suddenly you can take the red and the green out. And if you take the red out of the picture with your mind, you can take the blue and the green out. So they are not connected at the pairwise level, but they are connected at the triple level. This is a triple connection that cannot be reduced to pairwise connections. And this is just an um, analogy to say there are things, there are relationships that can exist in a group that cannot be reduced to relationships that exist in subsets of that group. So that is going to be our starting point. And from here, we want to measure this in data. How can we do that? And for that, we're going to use a little bit of information theory, and I will give you a crash course on something called information decomposition, that is what we're going to use. And this story goes like this. You have some cookies, a pair of cookies in your kitchen, and you go and you have bread from the side for the cookies, and you go and suddenly they are gone. You are super angry, so you hire a detective, and you ask the detective, please find who the hell took my cookies. And there are nine with, um, um, suspects, and the detective have to find out who was the, the thief of the group. So we have two witnesses, and the witnesses are going to provide different clues to the detective to find the group. The first witness say, I think I saw that the witness had a mustache. So that's the first bit of information. And then he would say, I also saw that he was wearing a hat. But with that information, you can reduce the candidates from nine to two. We are doing good progress. But we are still not sure who exactly it is. We still are, have a little bit of doubt. The second witness said, yes, I'm sure he was wearing with the mustache, and then it was a red hair. So with that, you reduce in a different way, and suddenly, by combining these two, we know who was the good, right? So taking psychology aside and making this thing simple, we can say that the information given by the two witnesses can be taxonomized in different classes. 
So mustache is redundant. It's information that was given by both witnesses. And you could have gotten that from witness A or from witness B. Pile of red hair is unique because you could only get it in one and you couldn't get it from the other. And the identity of the thief is something synergistic in the sense that you can get it only when you have two, so the two sources at the same time. It's not something you can get from A or you can get from B, but if you can, you can get from AB, right? And this is something that just happened in information. That's the way it's going to be. So we can do a little bit of mathematics with this idea of, of synergistic information, and which I will not do here. If you're interested, please go to the beautiful paper and a lot of follow-ups. Uh, but the idea is you can build lattices of information. And the lattice for this is the lattice for two sources. So we have three types of information, synergy, unique, and redundancy. So this uh, is the mutual information, channel mutual information between variables x1 and x2 directed to witnesses, and y that is the culprit. You, there is something called the chain rule of information that is a very classic information theoretic thing that you can say the information given by both can be decomposed in the information given by the first and the information given by the second conditioned on the information given by the first. This is classic information theory. And this information decomposition business is going one step further in the decomposition. And you say this information given by the first can be redundant or unique. And the information given by the second condition of the first is unique and synthesis. And then you try to find formulas for all of these, and you can arrange them in this point lattice, and you can do a lot of mathematics and anti-chain, partial object, etc. But what I want you to take from this is that information is not born equal, it can have different like modes. And specifically, we are going to follow focus in these three types of information. <clears throat> so all this is great. But now if we want to apply this to brains, there is a little problem. So in brains, usually we measure different regions and we have all these time series. And then we would like to do something like information decomposition here, but the previous formalism allow us to have a lot of witnesses, a lot of sources of information, but only a single target. And here is not clear who is the target. Like we could take all of these sources, the three, but then what is the target? The one or the two or the three or all of them together or what? So we would also like to decompose the target. So, so this PAD part of the information decomposition, that's the classic of now 15 years, is great for this. So you can have multiple variables in the target as a vector, but you cannot distinguish their differential role between them. And we did an extension on what we call, for different reasons, integrated information decomposition that is takes into account multiple sources and multiple targets. And the intuition of how it works is simple. Let's say we have two time series. You do first a forward partial information decomposition where these two sources predict this joint target. And then you're decomposing this. This is the dynamical information that goes from past to future. You divide it in redundancy, unique, unique, and similar. And then you play this game that you do the same thing backward. So you take these two sources and this joint past up target, and then you get a different decomposition of the same quantity. And then you do some lattice magic. And you get the product. And basically, you get all the possible combinations of being redundant in the past and then being redundant in the future, or being unique in the past and then synergistic in the future. Suddenly, you move from four to four times four equals 16. So there are 16 modes of information when you have two types of. And now, the beautiful lattice that before was a simple diamond for two times here, it looks like a dismiss, there's a football or whatever. But I will try to convince you that this is not so bad, and we can build intuitions of what is it. So, for example, <laughs> the, the, the way we write these things is that, for example, here is information that was only in one and then stays only in one in the future. This information that was only in two and then stays in two. This, like one and two, is redundancy. And this is redundancy that stays redundant. And this, like information that is in one, two is synergy and then stays in synergy. So these four modes, the information was in a way and stayed the same way. So we call all of this storage. Something was in a way, stayed the same, stayed there, is being stored. Now we have this was unique in the past and now is redundant. And was unique in the past in the other one and was now is redundant. We call this copy. So what's unique, it was only in one place and not in the other, and now is in both places. So it has been copied from one to the other. 
this was only in one and now it's only in two. And this was only in two and now it's only in one. So that is trust. It was in one place, now it's in another place. This one was in both places and now it's only in one place. So it was erased from one of both. You see, so you can write, you, you can think and get intuition of <coughs> most of these ones. And, and here start coming the funny ones. So this was information that was synergistic. So it was in both and not in the parts. And now it's only in one. So the group is determining something that is happening in only one of this group. And we call this downward causation. I will explain more what we call it. But this is synergistic information that is going to unique or redundant. So the main point is that all of these atoms have some intuition that you can build. Um, maybe you're familiar, maybe not, but there is a bunch of measures of dynamical complexity, including uh, integrated information, information storage, and entropy. All of these measures, you can put them together and say, transfer entropy, for example, is the sum of these atoms. Because of density is the sum of this, integrated information is the sum of this minus this. So the point I want to make with this is that this, this gives us a unified language to talk about dynamical complexity. So we can say, oh, these two are different, are similar because they share a lot of parts, but they are different because they differentiate this. And then you can also say, oh, I actually don't want to have this guy, so I will take it out, or I will put this other in. So you can tailor your own thing depending on what you want to measure. So this gives us a common alphabet to talk about dynamics. And, and this whole business is about sort of doing dynamical system theory. So we're going to study dynamics of systems, but we describe it with the language of information. And we can discuss a little about that if you want, but that's sort of the basic idea. We are using information to describe dynamics. Okay, that is the end of the universe. I hope you get some idea. I'm not expecting you to get the details, but some feeling of it. And now let's say, how do we measure emergence with all this uh, machinery? So this is our setup. We have a system composed on N so far. We have N subparts so measure at time t. T is going to vary. Usually we consider time series, so T is different. We can consider a function of a state at a given moment, and that is going to be E, and that's a macro feature. So let's say these are spins, and the spins are doing some spin thing. And then this is the mean energy, you know, something like that. And then we have some time evolution going on the micro, and the time evolution going to induce uh, dynamics on the macro. Good. So this is the basic setup. Now, informally, we're going to say we are going to do some math, a little bit of math, and the math is going to tell us that there are two types of emergence. One type of emergence, the macro in the past, determines what the spins are going to do in the future. So because the energy was very high, this spin number two is going to go down or whatever. So the, the, a collective property is affecting specific people in the field. And the other flavor is that this guy ignores what is happening below, but is determining himself in the future. So there is this kind of decoupling of layers. And the macro layer is doing its thing and it doesn't care about what is going on below. And there are these different, these different types. Now let's go a bit more formal. So the definition of emergence is going to be based on a specific macro, specific supervenient property. And we would say a specific supervenient property exhibit called emergence with respect to the micro if if it's a function. If it's not a function, you're cheating because you could be putting anything else in. that doesn't that's unfair. So it has to be a supervenient and it's providing some unique information about the future. It's saying something about what is going to happen that was not, cannot be found in the parts by themselves. That is the definition of a miracle. Now, you could rightly say, how on earth can this thing have information about the future that is not in the parts if this is a function of the thing? Because the function is a core training, you are just losing information. If there is no way that you can gain new information with the core training, right? The trick, and this is a dirty trick, this unique information is not with respect to this as a unity, but with this as them separately. So you look to the spin one and you ask him, what can you tell me? And then you forget about spin one and you go to spin two and you say, what can you tell me? So you, you ask each of them separately. So you don't consider their relationships or their correlation or whatever. So you ask how much information you get from the parts by themselves, and you compare the information that you get from this. And you would see some examples where you can get a bit more feeling of 
publish it. But that is the trick you do in order to get some information that could be in the macro that is predictive of the key. All right. So now, uh, I said this already. In my opinion, uh, mathematical theory, the value of the mathematical theory is number of theorems divided by the number of definitions. So the question is how many theorems we can get out of the definition. And I will show three theorems that are um, what you can get out of this. The first is to say, so the definition of emergence was based on a macro feature, a very specific macro construction. It could be the mean energy or it could be something, but it's always a bit. But you could ask, is there anything intrinsic on the micro that allows it to have some emergent thingy floating on top? And there is. And that is to have dynamical synergy. So this theorem says, if the system has dynamical synergy, that means you take all these parts as sources, as witnesses, and you ask, can, can they have some synergistic information about their joint future? And the theorem says, if there is synergy there, there exists some function B that is emergent. So we can call this synergy the capacity to emerge. Now you have no idea which is it. And in some cases, we, we see in the brain that the brain has this type of synergy. And some, sometimes we would like to know what is the emergent property. But this is not going to tell us what. So then you have to be smart, you have to find yourself. But that is the bad part of the theory. But the good part is that if you don't, if you're not clear about what is the property, you can still have this intrinsic criteria to determine the capacity for emergence. So what does feature mean here? Feature means uh, is it a function or is it yes. a yes. 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 okay? Yeah, I should say macro microscopic yeah. variable. Yeah. But, but, but it is more than that is a function. All right, so theorem number two takes theorem number one as starting point. So we start from this capacity for emergence, and then you do a little bit of mathematics with this value, and you can prove that this synergy can be decomposed in two terms. And in the case of two time series, the, this D term corresponds to this atom, and this D term corresponds to these three atoms. And you can show that if this guy is larger than zero, you can have this type of downward causation in the sense that the information provided by this is affecting individual errors. And you can show also that if this is larger than zero, there is some information about itself that it cannot be taken from this guy. So basically these two modes of emergence is coming from the math. It's not that, oh, I think that there should be two. It's, it's, it's something that comes from the lattice, from the, from the way that is constructed. And again, there are proofs and everything more rigorously in the paper just to give you a basic intuition. And the last theorem that for me is the most important one is that if you want to measure this, you have to calculate the joint distribution of hundreds or thousands of variables and in practice you can never do it. So if this would be the end of the story, this would be a very pretty theory, but you couldn't do much things in practice. So this third theorem is about a practical criterion of how to measure this. And what this says is that you can measure this thing. And this is a super simple thing. So this is sort of the autocorrelation of the macro, but in the nonlinear version. So mutual information of the macro in the past and in the future, how much you can predict of the mean energy based on the past value of the mean energy. And then you calculate how much you can predict about the mean energy in the future based on the spin seven and then spin eight. And, you know, each spin, how much does it tell you in the past about what is going to be the macro in the future. And let's say you can predict within like 50%. And spin one tells you 1%, and spin two tells you 5%. So you sum up all this prediction power of separate parts, and you compare it against this part. And if you can predict more of what you can predict, the sum of the prediction parts from each of the little parts, then you're in business. There is emergence. Make sense? So and uh, interestingly, this arrow goes this way, but it doesn't go this way. So it's a sufficient criteria, but it's not necessary. Why is that? Because it could be that the predictive power of spin one and two is very correlated. So it, you're, you might be double counting. So that's the price you pay for the statistical uh, convenience. Because the good thing is that these are all binary distributions. These are super easy to calculate. If you have a spin system of a thousand spins, 
This is easy. Like these are numerical variables, these are binary variables. You can calculate, you don't need so much data. And I will show you we can do stuff with the game of life and big systems because of this. But if the criterion fails, you are not sure. <laughs> but if the criterion say yes, you are very happy. So if I have to choose one direction, I, this is the direction I would choose. So in, in summary, this is very simple to compute. It avoids the force of dimensionality. You can do big systems and it's very computational practice, practical because you, you might miss the text, but it doesn't give you a problem. Of course, you do have to do the statistics right. You have to do unbiased estimator to days, et cetera, et cetera. But if you do all the, all the numerics carefully, you can do a lot of it. All right. So let's go to some examples. Uh, are you familiar with the Reynolds plotting model? This is a mathematical model of bird plotting. So basically, the birds are going to be these arrows, and they have some equations, dynamical equations, and you have some parameters that you can play with. So for example, here we have an army, not army, it's so a super rigid. They follow each other like very rigidly. And because they are so rigid, they are just circling around each other. And the center of mass, that is our candidate for emergent feature, is not doing much. So intuitively, there's not going to happen nothing interesting. So, so now, uh, more in general, the micro system is the position of each of the birds, and the emergent feature, <laughs> the candidate for emergence, is the center of mass of this flock. Now, the crazy birds here is absolutely no attachment between birds, so they're doing whatever they want, and it's a whole mess. And the center of mass, the red dot, is also doing whatever it wants. So it's also likely that nothing interesting will happen. But in between, you have interesting stuff where each of the birds are fairly free to do what they want, I mean, relatively, but the center of mass is doing a much more self-consistent dynamic. And if you now calculate this, this uh, practical criteria, you see that if we do a sweep over different avoidance strength, which is what distinguishes these three types, we see that in between, we have a decent regime where we have this criteria saying, yes, the center of mass is doing something. Now, what does this mean in practice? It means that you ask bird number four, where is this flow going? The bird has very little idea. So each of the birds know very little about where the flow of the flock as a whole is going. But the flock as a whole is very consistent. So if the flock is going in one way, that is predictive of what's going to keep going in the future. All right? So how should I, I interpret causal decoupling here uh, in this case? Yeah, um, decoupling would be uh, the case that the, the um, the flock predicts itself to an extent that the birds do not predict the flock. Now, the word causal is a bit tricky mm -hmm. because in in this case you could yeah I, I'm I'm moving a bit no, I will save that discussion for a bit. <laughs> <laughs> so so for now the coupling does mean that the flock as a whole yeah, is sort of acting separately from the flock's property. Yeah yeah. And if I look at the central cost motion, then clearly there is memory in the center. If you look at the the middle picture, yeah, the right one doesn't have say, basically a white noise. Exactly. One is, exactly. Um, so this one fails because there is nothing to predict. Yeah. This one fails because you can't predict nothing because it's random. And this one is the right mix. Yeah. So now the, now the question is, if I simply look at the this emergent variable, uh, the center of convolutions, and if I write down an equation which captures this memory, then I basically know that it is. Yeah. 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 Yeah, this is very atom model only just to show a system where this is plausible. So basically the way it works is that you build a criteria of something like it. Then there are systems where you have strong intuitions and then you test it to see if it follows your intuitions. And then you jump to something more crazy where you can't predict so much what was going to happen. So this is a little bit of a jump like that. So here we are studying macaque intracranial data. So these are monkeys that you have a lot of electrodes in the motor cortex, 64 of them. Uh, it open data sets from some teams in Japan. And the monkeys are doing a grabbing task. So they are very hungry and there's food and they grab the food. And so our micro variables are 64 intracortical channels in the brain of the monkey. And the emergent feature, there was a, a, a very funny discussion. So we wanted in the beginning the emergent feature to be the hand position. Because the question was, is the hand movement an emergent property of the parts of the brain? That will be not fair because is the even if you say yes the brain is determining what the hand is doing it's very likely that there are parts of the brain that you are not measuring that is affecting what the hand is doing 
So then the hand is going to have a much more autocorrelation than what you're measuring. So that's why it's very important to be a deterministic function of what you're measuring. If not, it's too easy to, to satisfy this. So what we did, we decided to build a predictor. So based on this, uh, on the states, uh, you build a, a smart predictor of the hand position, which is a function of the state. So it's not a perfect predictor, but it's a pretty good one. So we use some um, uh, very simple machine learning, like support vector machines and stuff like that. So this is the pipeline. You have here the, all the electrodes, you have all the signals. You have in blue here, the hand position in the three dimensional axis, x, y, z. Then the orange is the outcome of the predictor. So the predictor is a simple function that is being applied the same functional way, applied at each time point, and you get this orange. And see that the prediction is fairly reasonable. And then you ask, is this orange thing emergent from the channels? And the answer is yes. So here we play a little bit. We are here considering two time scales, uh, the, sorry, uh, two time points, T and T prime. And we can vary the separation between the time points and we could see that for most of them, the criteria was satisfied. So, okay, we get that yes. Now, what is the meaning of this? Well, the meaning of this is that if you want to predict the hand position, uh, very differently, how could this Okay. One option would be channel 64 is the most predictive of the thing, and all the rest are not very helpful. That would be that the hand position is not emerging from the sides that we're measuring. So if individual channels would be very strongly predictive, then no emergence. Or maybe channel 64 in some values, and then like you have, you know, you have this sort of stepwise function that is the, the, the when, when channel 64 is the highest, but when it's 63 is the highest, so you could be switching from channels from one channel to another, but always predicted from individual channels. Then also no emergence. So what we're seeing is that the predictor is very much mixing everything in order to do a prediction. And that is what we're learning. So we're learning something interesting, but uh, you know, that, 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 that's what you get from it. Uh, what, what could uh, happen if you're missing like uh, an essential uh, micro? Uh, variable. Uh, could it be that it's sort of um, the actual driving thing, and then it's just correlations that you pick up from the left, from the rest? Yeah. So, um, so I mean, if it's too essential, then arguably you couldn't predict. So, uh, if you build a good predictor, that predictor would still be making a lot of mistakes. Now, uh, another important point is what you're mentioning. Like, if you are not measuring all the causal variables, you cannot say this is causal element. This is not causal in this example. This is predicted. So this is about prediction, but it's not about causal. Yes. I have another question because uh, the brain, like everything in the universe, is not a closed system, right? So, for example, yeah. Yeah. Um, uh, basically, um, I'm wondering because uh, hand movement maybe is reactive to something that's happening outside. For example, you would have a person or a game, and then you, you move your hand in response to that. And so if you're just measuring the brain variables, then it doesn't take into account, for example, yeah, it's kind of related to your question. Like, it's not only micro-level variables, but just variables with another interact another system that's interacting with the system that you're measuring. Mm -hmm. Yeah, but uh, I think you have to distinguish, uh, like for example, the, the typical example, you have fire, the fire creates smoke, and the smoke brings alarm. Yeah. So is the fire causing the alarm? You say, no, because the smoke is in between. Or no, but it's mm -hmm. causing it. You know, but you have these chains of causality. Yeah. So in the case you're mentioning, of course, the monkey could be reacting to trillions of things, but mm -hmm. it's going through the brain states. And then if you condition on the brain state, maybe all these other influences are, are gone. Or maybe maybe not, but uh, but uh, that's a usually in causality you have these causal diagrams are very helpful, and it's very different to be causal but being mediated by something else than being, and because the other option is that you have the brain and there's this other thing that's going by the side. Yeah, thinking about like reflexes, maybe it doesn't go to the exactly. actual brain. For example, <laughs> yeah. Yeah. And, and I'm super on board on embodied cognition and extended mind and all that. <laughs> But uh, but but the, the, what I like with this framework is that it's not giving you the answer; it's just tools to test different yeah. hypotheses. Yes. So I have another question, it's also related to that. Can you use this reverse way, for example, as to which part is the more essential part to measure? Um, I would think so. Like, but I mean, you could build different predictors from different subtests, and then you could measure the emergence for different ones, and you could you could. Right, I think. Mm -hmm. But uh, um, like the question of 
if you don't know what is the, in, in this case, you're fine because you have a target and that is going to drive the building of the predictor, etc. But if you don't have a target, then it's complicated. <laughs> we, we are still lacking of, of uh, data driven ways to build the emergent feature. And even if you could find, uh, they might not be very informative. Because, yeah, so this, this thing has two interpretations. One is that it tells you, let me put it differently, like in the case of the flock of birds, it kind of makes sense to look at the flock. So you have intrinsic interest in the flocks. But if you get a weird function that is very uninterpretable, in some cases, could be interesting, kind of, in some cases, you would not care. So uh, we're, we're a bit trying to figure out in the moment on how, how far the data-driven approach goes with this. And in the beginning, I was very sympathetic to it, but now I'm less, <laughs> because I feel that you can get things that is like, yes, it's emerging, but I have no idea what it is, so I don't care. But, but we're in the process of, of understanding exactly where, where this lies. But, but I think there is, this observer is playing out quite important role here. Perhaps I have a question. What about the time lag? Because if you are looking at these signals, of time, yeah. the hand movement of the function of time, are you then trying to predict uh, the, the combination of these brain signals at the same time at the uh, with the hand signal, or you have a time lag and your dimension is basically infinite? Yeah, so the prediction from brain to hand is always simultaneous. Right. And what happens if you take uh, time lag? So the time lag we're taking from the past of the future between the micro and the macro. Yeah, yeah, but I mean, uh, your time lag can be two yeah, yeah. microseconds to 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 couple of seconds, right? I mean, but you, you mean this time lag or or the time lag between uh, time lag between the combined combination of the signals and the well, I I suppose you will look at the same uh, same. What frequency are you? What's your measuring frequency? Typically, it's one millisecond. Yeah. Right. Okay. So, and then if you, I mean, millisecond is a very short time scale, and there's also communications going on across yeah, different channels. Yeah. I agree. I agree. your uh, data uh, dimensionality is basically infinite. Yeah. Yeah. I agree. We are we're hoping to do a um, spectrally resolved emergent criteria because also you could have emergent in one frequency and not in another. So we're hoping to do a, a spectral decomposition of this. To answer that partially. Another sort of elephant in the room is that we are taking two time points. And if the system is Markovian, that's fine. But if the system is non Markovian, that is not fine. Okay. So that's uh, what I'm referring to. Yes. So that, that's another thing we're trying to do now. How do we deal with non Markovian systems? And even if you have a non Markovian micro and you coarse grain, the coarse grain inversion can be non Markovian. Yeah. So you could be um, like putting. Uh, yeah, we miscalculate some of the predictions, but uh, we have some ideas that we are, we are, we are working on that. Yes. Uh, I've got another question because you also said um, that basically um, that there, yeah, part of what uh, can explain this emergence is that there's relationships within <clears throat> within this macro com, com, uh, within the macro level that are not existent within the micro or sub components. And uh, so the purpose here is uh, relationships. So I'm wondering because you're summing the linear correlations between the individual micro components and the micro. Have you tried then also maybe looking at interactions between the micro components and maybe nonlinear relationships? Because in yeah. the end, you would like to understand what exactly explains this yeah. uh, like unexplained variance. Yeah, two yeah. things. Uh, first is that the relationships are nonlinear. Non yeah, exactly. I, I mentioned a correlation just to uh, mm -hmm. intuition, but all these are nonlinear correlations. That's a small clarification. Now, the important point that you're mentioning, we are considering unique information with respect to parts in isolations. Mm -hmm. But uh, there is a lot of space between parts of isolation. Then you can have pairwise relationship, you can have yeah. different relationship, four point relationship. And it would be nice to know where is the level that matters. Mm -hmm. The formalism allows you to do that. So I didn't went over that to simplify, but you can have. When you define emergence, uh, whereas it would here with this criteria, these actually have an uppercase one. So this is unique with respect to, to individual parts. You can have upper, uppercase K, that I don't mention, but we have to make things simple. But you can have unique information with respect to parts of order cardinality one or two or three or four, et cetera. So you, for example, if you have two, you would be considering groups of two for all the pairwise correlations. Mm -hmm. And you and then you can do another criteria here where you're going to consider all the first here. The problem is that the higher the K, 
Yeah, there's another case. <laughs> uh, yeah, but you know, you know what I mean. The, the problem is if you start considering like like set duplex here, in one hand you start double counting like crazy. Yeah. And on the other hand, you're going to start needing eight dimensional distributions. So the 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 the, 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 the sampling becomes more of a problem. But uh, so but that's another but but a super interesting question is that if you satisfy the criterion for K1, you will not satisfy it for K7. So at some point the thing will break. And if you could find exactly at what point it breaks, that would be super, super cool. Mm -hmm. We still don't have the the numerical machinery to do it properly, but we we are trying to go there. <laughs> Any other question? So let's go to brains. Mm -hmm. So what can we do about cognition and consciousness? Mm -hmm. So first question, now what can you tell us about the the human brain? So for this, we did a study on synergy in the human brain. So this is not so, this is all related with the Americans learning synergy in some ways. So what we did here, we took some <laughs> open data set from the human connection project, 100 subjects in Western state with fMRI. So 100 people doing nothing for a while, they have discovered. We do the data, we do standard pre-processing, we end up with uh, 100 or 200 brain regions, so time series. And then what we did, in this case, we have no idea what the emerging feature could be. So what do we do? We go to this criteria that say synergy is the capacity for emergence. So we start studying synergy, but we cannot do synergy of the hundred trees because that is just flows. So we took a very uh, practical approach. We said, okay, let's start from somewhere. And we took all the pairs of regions and we calculate the phi ID, the integrated information, the composition thing for every pair of region. And there were too many atoms, so we thought, let's focus on the topmost, uh, the one of the causal decoupling, and this bottommost, that is the redundancy to redundancy. Why? Because we, why not? <laughs> we have to reduce the dimensionality of this somehow. So we focus just on this two. And because we did that for every pair of regions, we end up with networks. But very funny networks where uh, a link correspond to the synergy capacity for two and the redundancy thing for every two. So the network of redundancy, the network of synergy, right? And then uh, these networks for every subject, and then uh, again, the network were too complicated, so we average over columns, <laughs> and then we rank every region according to their relative redundancy on synergy level. So, if, and, and then we took the difference between the two rankings, and we get a grade. So in this gradient, if you are in the synergy part, you are a brain region that tends to be involved in synergistic dynamics. If you are in the redundancy part, you are a brain region that tends to be engaged in redundant dynamics. All right? And with that, then we plot it. And this is how it looks. I don't know if you know about neuroscience, but this looks very pretty because this is the motor and sensory motor cortex, and it looks very blue, very redundant. And this is the frontal region, and this is the, the full mode network, and all this looks very red. So just from this very data-driven thing, you let the, the you crack the numbers, you get the plots, and they map really nicely with what we know about the brain. Then you can do this separately. So these are the different resting state networks. So this is the default mode network, and this is the frontoparietal network. These are the more this is the executive decision making, etc. And this is like the network that activates when you're doing nothing and you're self-reflecting and stuff like that. All of these are pretty in the synergistic side of the brain and the somatomotor network, very redundant. So this is sort of another way of seeing the same thing. Then we went to something called the Neurosyn meta-analytic uh, thing. That is a web page that you can put some words and then you get the regions that are, um, you, you match articles that relate that, uh, that word with different regions. So you can say, this is a way of seeing what type of words are assigned to what type of frame regions in the literature. And if we do, we took a lot of different things from simple low level to complicated high level. And this is this, this from redundancy to synergy. And you see a fairly reasonable correlation of more in the redundant side of the gradient, more simple tasks, and in the synergistic side of the gradient, more complicated high level stuff. Then we look at the networks themselves and we study their efficiency and their, so how easy or hard is to move from one node to another by walking. 
And then their modularity, how much damage I have to do if I want to tear them into the middle parts. And lo and behold, the redundancy is very modular. You can break it into parts. It's very, it's less efficient than the other one. The other is super efficient. They can go anywhere. And it's very non-modular. It's very hard to divide points. And then we calculate the correlation, the similarity between the redundancy and the synergy networks with the structural connection. That is the wiring of the brain, the physical wiring. And the redundancy network is much, much more similar to the structure than the synergy network. All right. <coughs> and then we went to see monkeys. And we did the same thing in monkeys. And this is the way it looks. So not the same, but fairly similar. And then this is the, the redundancies between human and macaques are fairly the same. And the synergies are very different. So all this are building up into an interesting story. Then we also study the synergy to redundancy gradient with respect to cortical expansion. This is the degree to which different brain regions have experience expansion with respect to our macaque friends. And these are the degree to which different brain regions are expressing different genes that are distinctive of humans. And in both, we have significant correlations. All of these were corrected in many ways of okay, rotations or some sort and et cetera. So, so all, all of this is pointing in, in sort of the same direction, right? However, you might argue very correctly all of these are correlations. We, you know, these are observational data. We are not perturbing anything. So we are trying to do causal statements about this, and so these are going into AI systems. So, for example, here we have a neural network that is being trained in four different tasks. So we are considering a decision-making task one and a decision-making task two that are very different from each other. And then decision task one with some context and decision task two with some context. And all of these, the idea that you have two tasks that are very similar, two tasks that are very similar, and between them, they're all very different. And we try different training sequences. So in one case, you train for one, and then you train for the other. And in the other case, you train for one, train for the other, you, you switch constantly. So I don't know if you're familiar with this type of stuff, but if you do this, Neural networks tend to forget catastrophically what they learn first. So you ride a bike and then you ride a skate and then you try to ride a bike and you fall back. That's what a neural network will do. But if they, if they do like this, they tend to behave a little bit better. All right? So after that, we hear uh, if, if it's say two, it means sequential, and if you say uh, uh, and here is uh, intermediate. So if we train the neural network with similar tasks, so this is a decision-making one and context decision-making one, or the opposite origin, or stuff like that, or interleaved. So this is sequential or interleaved. They are all performing pretty well because all these tasks are similar. And the synergy, the synergy is the x-axis is fairly low. So this is expected. And this is the fun part. So here you're doing sequential from one to two. So performance pretty bad. Sequential from two to one, pretty bad. And interleaved two to one to two, you get much better performance and much higher safety. So what is the intuition here is that if, if you have two neural systems learning different tasks, they specialize, no problem. But if you're trying to learn two different tasks with the same hardware, they need to share stuff and they need to do something smart. And it seems that synergy has to do with that. All right, so putting all that together, we come with this story that redundancy ma could be related with the input output of the brain, like sensory motor, like when you sense, when you act, things that need to be quick, things that cannot fail. Like a tiger is coming, you can't <coughs> make it wrong. You know, you have to run. And synergy would be related with global integration, like different things that come from different parts and have to be built together is uh, associated with these associative areas that are receiving very different sorts of information and they're making the most of them and it seems to support a uh, high coordination that distinguishes from much. All of this is a um, work in progress, has some limitations, but it's a compelling story. Right. Cool, so this is cognition. Now, what can we say about consciousness? And I have a few minutes, but I will do my best. So we were studying here um, the same data. We started with the same data at first, so the same HCP data set. And then we took some data set from subjects under anesthesia. 
six, 15 subjects before, during, and after observation. And then we also took some data from 22 patients with uh, like severe uh, brain damage, where they have they are in vegetative state or minimally conscious. And they, we have the scanner, and then we have uh, <laughs> And what we did, we proposed an informational architecture of the brain. So you know the cycle of water, that you have water in the sea, and then it goes uh, evaporates, and then the brain, and then it goes by the river, something like this, but with information. <clears throat> so you have the world here, and it's being perceived by specialized models in the brain, so the eye, the ears, and then you're here, and then there is something that we call gatekeeping, that sometimes lets some disinformation into something we call the synergistic global workspace. And these will be the associated areas in the brain that take information from different specialized models and they mix it and they synergize it and they get the most from the combination. And after that, you make decisions and stuff like that. And then you have to broadcast for this information to come back to specialized models that then make actions into the world and then the cycle continues. So this is just an intuitive picture of how information flow will be between the world and the brain. We call this Sapphire because it's synergy phi and redundancy. Phi is this uh, integrated information measure that I mentioned very briefly before. So this is just a, an idea. And from there, from here, we want to try to ground this idea into something we can measure to see if we get some agreement. So we operationalize some of these ideas in very concrete uh, and also limited way. So we say, uh, we think that the global workspace, this thing is characterized by synergy. We think that the way into the workspace would be by being a hub in the synergy network. You remember the synergy network that we saw before? That's a network. And you can see which are the hubs of that network. And we are just saying, we think maybe the, gate, the way into the workspace would be determined by the, net, the break regions that behave like hubs in that network. And then the way out, of the network, because of everything we have seen that redundancy is associated with social motor, etc., we say if you are half of the redundancy network, maybe you're involved in this broadcasting uh, function. And then we assume that the consciousness, uh, when it's lost, it would be related with the breakdown in the workspace associated with lost in integrated information. I haven't talked too much about integrated information, but these are a lot of theories about consciousness and integrated information and. We're taking one measure of that. All right. So this is a way of operationalizing this. This is not the only way, but we just wanted to start from somewhere that we could measure and then we can see how it works and then we can improve. So we took the HCP data and lo and behold, the hubs of the synergy network were correspond very beautifully with the default mode network. If you are familiar with neuroscience, so all the purple regions are the ones from the default mode network that are is typically associated with the type of thing where you happen when you're not doing anything and you self reflect and stuff like that. And then the hubs in the redundancy region uh, uh, network are very strongly related with this um, um, front operator network, the decision making network. So, based on this network theory idea from these things, we got a surprisingly good match with what we know about resting state networks. Then we, uh, we measure the, um, this integrated information thing that I didn't talk so much about it, but this quantity that had been traditionally associated with, with the consciousness. And we saw that most of the, yeah, there is mainly reduced in, in loss of consciousness and the reductions are mainly located in the default mode network. So from here, the conjecture will be consciousness fails when the in the way into the this workspace breaks down. And to conclude, because I'm running out of time, uh, we study this emergence capacity. You remember from previous slides, how the emergence capacity looks like in the DOC patients, in the patients with uh, with um, uh, brain damage. So we calculate this emergent capacity and we measure it here. And here are control subjects. These are the minimally conscious and these are the vegetative state patients. And you see a reduction in this capacity for emergence. This is directly from data. And then we did a um, whole brain modeling. So there is a whole business of computational models of the brain, of the whole brain, 
that you they are they have to bring different sources of information uh, of uh, the connectome the uh, a lot of information that you bring together you create this computational model you train the model you verify that it is well trained and then you generate new synthetic data and then you measure again the thing and we could reproduce the finding and if you're interested the, the interesting thing of for brain models is that when they are working then you can start breaking them in a way that you can break humans like and then you can see what is exactly driving this difference and in the paper here we explored uh, the paper is published now but but you can find it the same time. So with that, I'm almost done. Uh, let's summarize some ideas. The first is that having mathematics of emergence is very interesting. And it can help us to reason about emergence, to guide discussions, and to progress, to advance okay, all of this. Um, as I said before, in my view, the main thing we gain from these formal approaches is that we can now frame conjectures in a very precise way, and then we can let data to evaluate those conjectures. So and we can relate statistics and basically we can bring emergence to empirical science and we can use it for, for experiments and stuff and do data analysis. We show some results that suggest that the emergent brain dynamics might be supporting human cognition and consciousness. Of course, this is very preliminary. There's only a few starting papers and we need verification and more detailed study, but so far all of this is very promising. And most importantly, this is very new. All these tools have just a couple of years, and we need a much more work to be done in order to fully explore the possibilities and understand exactly the implications of all this. And with that said, all these are I'm just a little part in this uh, very synergistic team of people. Um, so this is all a joint work with other people. And um, thank you for your attention and questions. Any questions for Fernando? Yeah, sure. I'm I'm a biologist, so I'm probably going to say a lot of wrong terminology. I hope I can get some kind of question across. Mm -hmm. um, I like the the set fire idea on how 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 to relate the anatomy and the local distribution of what you call as more redundancy or, not, or what is not. But yeah, you saw the somatosensory cortex is very much associated with more more redundancy. But in your set fire, it was mostly about the output of the pi. Yes, um, I'm right, I'm right. processing, but sensory cortex uh, is definitely, as the name suggests, uh, yeah, so related to the input. So exactly. the way I saw it before I saw your sapphire is that all the regions that are, is it the first hub basically between um, the senses and the muscles, which are the output essentially of the brain, are more redundancy. And because essentially you, the model fits nicely with the brain, I think, because all the information in the brain also follows a path. Mm -hmm. um, it arrives first in the sensory and goes through all these associations, which are not redundant. And then the motor cortex is <laughs> one of that's more of an output, and that is also redundant. So I thought about the in and output. Yeah, but it's a super interesting observation. So my, I, I never thought about this before, but my first thought is that one thing is to build this gradient. And then in the gradient, you have the sensory motor very much in the redundancy side. And another thing is just to look at the network and see the, the topology of the network. And it seems that the although the motor or sensory motor are have the most probably redundant relationship, they might not be playing as topological important role in the network. And that's why they don't go uh, highlighted as hubs. But the the um, Contemporary network does. So it might be less strong the links, but topologically less uh <coughs> have like which which sort of makes sense. But uh, I will I will do a check. It's a, it's a it's a very cool these are two separate papers that we did a little bit separately, so it's a, a really nice uh, point of connection. Yeah, well it's, it's something that probably is orthogonal to this the subject of this talk, uh, at least when it comes from the statistical physics where we 
know the people are just for for a very long time. Um, there is a, a class of a group of scientists who who think that human or brains generally operate close to criticality. I have no idea what that means, uh, and I am not sure whether I mean how is how does this relate or does not a completely open direction uh, to to this integrated information theory picture. Um, and what does it even mean? Yeah, that, that's a super interesting Pandora box. Uh, the first clarification is that the emergence you have in phase transitions is very different from this one because uh, I would say this is process emergence, like emergence in time. And phase transitions are not really dynamical, they are basically defined in equilibrium systems. And so in a given snapshot, you change your parameter. The, the that parameter. is not entirely true, what okay. you're saying, because there is something called, well, uh, the avalanches that you actually start to that you see, uh, they can be explained using temporal criticality. What is temporal criticality? I will tell you later. But okay. 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 <laughs> okay, interesting. Yeah, so, yeah, to, to a first approximation, there is something about emergence in, in an equilibrium state where you are switching a control parameter and you switch from one branch to another, I would say that's perfectly emerging. And I'm not claiming this theory is um, encompass all the types of emergence. And I, we're actually writing a paper where we argue for different flavors of emergence. And so emergence would be sort of a umbrella term that is including a lot of different ways in which the system can be emergent. And phase transition would be one example, and this would be another type of emergence. So, and, and my feeling is that also with these three frameworks that I mentioned in the beginning, in the very beginning, we used to discuss with the other authors which was the right measure of emergence and which was wrong. And right now, I think they're all right. And it's a little bit like the story with the measures of complexity. Like in the beginning, we thought there should be one measure of complexity. And I hope at this day, we all agree that there is no single measure of complexity. Complexity is an umbrella. And when you talk about complexity, you should be able to say exactly what you mean beyond a measure of complexity. And as long as you know what you're talking, then you have a measure that's fine. So, so we we sort of gain resolution and we see that emergence is actually a lot of things mm -hmm. and, and that's progress. And I think in emergence, we're doing the same. So suddenly emergence stopping this sort of big uh, wobbly, uh, not very clear thing. And then you say, oh, there are different types of emergence and I care about cost of decoupling, or I care about phase transitions, et cetera. So we are now in the process, I think, of, of trying to map this, uh, to build a map of the types of emergence, how related they are, maybe not, they're not related. Uh, so that, that's the first part of the argument. The second part about brain criticality is, is, is a super interesting area because in one hand, you have a strikingly result that match really well, like all this story about avalanches is beautiful, et cetera, et cetera. So a number of empirical findings that in principle, there are no reason for them to be there, there either. So there is something there. But the translation, I find it is more difficult than when, what people would like it to be, because in my, I'm not an expert in criticality, but most of the models that people study in criticality, they are very homogeneous. You have spins, and they're, all the spins are the same, and you have a phase transition, and so you have a single point where the spin translates. And I have seen very little work on heterogeneous systems having phase transitions, and then things can be very complicated. Like, I, like sometimes you have a region of transitions and also a complicated thing. And the brain is super non homogeneous Like different regions are practically very different from each other. So, so to say the brain is an icing model is, is sort of like a fun idea to play around with, but it's, you can't take it too far. Um, um, I don't think that at least the papers that I've seen on brain criticality, they're not claiming I know, that. I know, I know. But my point Maybe is that to, to, to bridge the gap from simple, idealized physical models of criticality to the brain, I think is not very easy. Although I'm not saying it can be done, and I'm not saying it's not fun, but I think it's super fruitful. There is something about, for me, the most important lesson that we learn from statistical mechanics is that there is a lot to gain by losing. In biology, people don't want to lose anything and they want to learn everything and all the details and have crazy lists of facts. And I think that in, in statistical mechanics, when you try to you know predict all the spins or all the water molecules, you go crazy. But if you say, okay, I don't care about that, I care about the temperature, then probably you can do a lot of things. So there's something about finding the right degree of resolution that suddenly enables you know you can do things. And I think in the brain, there is 
I, I believe the, that you, there are things that you should ignore. And suddenly the thing becomes clear. And in biology, it's much more difficult because some people have spent their whole life studying, you know, this axon. And then you tell them, we should ignore that. They say, no. <laughs> and, I, I, and, and also, I don't know what to ignore. I mean, it's, it's hard. But, but I think there is something, in, an important lesson to be learned there and finding the right. Also, of course, different resolutions are going to matter for different things. So of course, there is not one resolution that is right for everything. And some people say, I also find an interesting argument to say the brain, when it's healthy, you can describe it at a very macro level, but then when the brain is unhealthy, then you have to go down to the, like the computer. You use a computer, you can just use the keyboard, but if the computer breaks, sometimes you have to open it up and see what is the wire that breaks. So maybe also different brain conditions require different resolutions. And I think there's a lot to gain there between everything that is now about the university classes and things like that on the brains. Thank you, Paula Castro, in the time, and people may have some issues uh, afterwards. So uh, that would be the end of the uh, of Science Jam for today. And thank you for your appearance. And this gift is for you. Thank, thank you, you for uh, delivering this uh, exciting talk. Yeah.